should he want you to cut your hair? I don't know. A very strange fad. As you may observe, Mr. Holmes, my hair is somewhat luxuriant and a rather peculiar tint of chestnut. And most artistic, if I may so observe. It has been considered so. I simply couldn't think of sacrificing it in such an offhand manner. Well, I should think not, indeed. Oh, such was my feeling at the time. The next day, I was inclined to think that I'd made a mistake. And the day after, I was sure of it. When I received a letter from the gentleman himself. I have it here, and I will read it to you. Dear Miss Hunter, Miss Stoper has kindly given me your address, and I write from here to ask whether you have reconsidered your decision. We are willing to give £30 a quarter, or £120 a year, so as to recompense you for any little inconvenience which our fads may cause you. And your hair? He is insistent. As regards your hair, it is no doubt a pity, especially as I could not help remarking its beauty during our short interview. But I am afraid I must remain firm upon this point, and I only hope that the increased salary may recompense you for the loss. Will it? My mind's made up that I will accept the offer. I thought, however, that before taking the final step, I should like to submit the whole matter for your consideration. My dear Miss Hunter, as your mind is already made up, the matter is settled. But if at any time you should find yourself in any doubt or danger... Danger? What danger do you foresee? It would cease to be a danger if we could define it. But at any time, day or night, a telegram will bring me down to your help. Then that is enough. I shall write to Mr. Rue Castle at once and go down to Hampshire quite easy in my mind now. Oh, thank you. Well, Holmes? I should allow no sister of mine to accept such a situation. He likes to keep us secure. But you look apprehensive, Miss Hunter. Not at all, Mr. Rupas. Good, good. Edward, I have looked forward to meeting you. Master Edward, this is your new governess, Miss Hunter. <laughs> oh, I see you have a present for Miss Hunter. <laughs> oh, well done, good shot. <laughs> Copper beaches, Mr. Rucastle. 
Oh, dead, Miss Hunter. <laughs> Mostly dead. Here we are, then. Come in, come in. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Toller, this is Miss Violet Hunter, who is taking up the position of governess to Master Edward. How do you do, Miss Hunter? Your room's all ready for you. Thank you. Come along now, Tola. Fetch the trunk. <laughs> oh, Miss Hunter. After you're refreshed from your journey, I'll take you on a tour of the Copper Beaches. This is a certainly extensive, Mr. Woolcastle. Oh, yes. And extensive premises need protection. Look in here. Isn't he a beauty? <coughs> Don't be frightened, Miss Hunter. It's only Carlo, my master. <laughs> I call him mine. But in fact, Toller is the only man that can do anything with him. He lets him loose at night. And God help any trespasser he lays his fangs upon. We feed him once a day. Not too much then, so that he's always keen as mustard. Oh, for goodness sakes, Miss Hunter. Under no pretext, set foot across the threshold at night. It's as much as your life is worth. <laughs> Come on, there. Mrs. Rucastle will be here shortly. And she will tell you herself how delighted she is you are able to accept the situation. Your offer was a most generous one, sir. Though, well, I am still curious about the conditions. My little fads and fences, you mean? Yes. <laughs> oh, they're nothing at all. <laughs> My wife is very fond of a particular shade of electric blue. And she would like you to wear such a dress indoors in the morning. But I do not have such a dress. Huh? But we have one. <laughs> As to sitting here or there or amusing yourself in any matter indicated, well, that need cause you no inconvenience, need it? No. How do you do, Miss Hunter? I'm sorry I was not here to greet you. A slight indisposition. I trust you are feeling better now. Much better. Thank you. I was just telling Miss Hunter about the blue dress. Yes. I think it would fit you very well.
I wonder what desperate circumstances could occasion such an appeal. I have devised seven separate explanations, each of which would cover the facts, as far as we know them. Oh. And which one do you favor, Holmes? At the moment, I have no favorites. Data. 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 I cannot make bricks without clay. Well, it's nice to get away from the fogs of Baker Street now and again. What delightful little farms these are, don't you agree? Aren't they fresh and beautiful? You know, Watson, it is one of the curses of having a mind with a term like mine, that I must look at everything with reference to my own special subject. Well, it doesn't make the scenery any less admirable, does it? You look at these scattered houses and you are impressed by their beauty. I look at them and the only thought which comes to me is a feeling of their isolation and of the impunity with which crime may be committed. Good heavens! Who would associate crime with these dear old homesteads? They always fill me with a certain horror. It is my belief, Watson, founded upon my experience. But the lowest and vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling and beautiful countryside. Had this young lady who appeals for us for help gone to live in Winchester, I should never have had a fear for her. It is the five miles of country which makes the danger. We cannot theorize without data, I'm afraid. Please, continue, Miss Hunter. In the first place, I may say that I've met on the whole with no actual ill treatment from Mr. and Mrs. Rucastle. But I'm not easy in my mind about them. And I cannot understand them. What cannot you understand? The reasons for their conduct. For two days after my arrival at the Copper Beaches, my life was very quiet. On the third, I went downstairs after breakfast to find Mr. and Mrs. Rucastle in the drawing room. Mr. Rucastle informed me that a dress, an electric blue dress, had been laid out for me in my bedroom and asked me to put it on. I did 